Can I go to Imad next? Thank you so much. This was a wonderful discussion and I learned a lot. Just a quick question to uh, all the panelists, uh, if you can um, at least give us um, one outcome from the second uh, conference on the zone and what would be the most ideal constructive outcome that can occur that would then facilitate uh, the processes for the rest of the year and also its impact on the review conference that is coming up since previous review conferences were um, uh, under a lot of pressure from the 1995 uh, indefinite extension that requires some steps towards the zone within that. So uh, that's my brief question and I'm looking forward to your answers. Thank you, Imad, and I, I will add to it, which, uh, which is uh, what needs to be done by particular participants next week to, to drive forward Imad's um, uh, question uh, and uh, a positive outcome. I, I want to turn to Taya first. Taya. Uh, I need to hear you. you so need, that's okay. it. Good. Thank you. No, I think one of the most important factors, both on, on, on the Middle East uh, conference and on, on the review conference, is the fact that one, one should actually um, declare that the nuclear weapon-free zones are a way to achieve a nuclear weapon-free world. And it's important to, to uh, get rid of the hindrances on the way. And as I mentioned, one of the hindrances is that some countries have nuclear weapons. They are not likely in the first phase to get rid of them, but they could actually issue these legally binding unconditional security assurances. And one should establish a forum which could actually verify that these are followed. And Taya, what's, what's getting in the way of these negative security assurances being well, issued? Well, I, I think the, the most biggest hindrance is the concept of deterrence, because deterrence is a concept which needs this ambiguity. The nuclear weapon states are not simply willing to issue clear commitments, and there's always this kind of conditions and, and conditionalities. And I think this has to be clarified that in case of nuclear weapon free zones, this, these clear commitments are necessary. Ambiguity is not the way to solve the nuclear weaponry zones because countries will not join. It's impossible to think that unless you are actually clear about that they will not be attacked by nuclear weapons, who would join? So this is the critical point and it's, it's actually also, uh, if you want to, reach a nuclear weapon free zone, it also, of course, undermines deterrence, mm -hmm. which for some is a good thing, for some others a problem. Mm -hmm. But the divide has to be drawn with the zones. Thank you. Uh, I'll come to you next while, just to remind you, um, the question is, what does success look like realistically for next week? And who in attendance can help bring success about? <clears throat> Thank you, Paul. And this is uh, a very interesting uh, discussion. But let me first respond to this. Uh, uh, we're getting a little bit obsessed with the idea of having the coming conference in a week a success. Mm -hmm. what, are, what is the criteria of, of, of success? Uh, and uh, we, we all need to understand that to all the Arab states and even to Iran, these are uncharted waters for them uh, 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 going uh, ahead with developing a treaty. And I don't believe they are getting enough serious support uh, 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 from the international uh, community. Yes, they are to be blamed for, um, for many things, the, the, this group of, of, uh, of states, but uh, we all realize that uh, uh, this region was without any uh, security structure ever, actually, uh, uh, that held together the security principles of the region. And this is why they are divided. Uh, they don't know where to go from here. Uh, they are focused on having some sort of a political statement. 
and then go home. Uh, this is why I think we need to work with some of the ideas that uh, Tarek uh, proposed and I proposed at a certain uh, stage regarding oiling the machinery to work intercessionally on a number of issues. Uh, but we have to be careful because the diplomats cannot really work on the technical issues. They will work for a while and then they will leave it. Uh, these working groups we are proposing uh, need to, be, if they can uh, agree on a couple of working groups in this conference, to me, this is success. In addition, there should be a clear mandate for the chair or the president of the conference to work for a whole year and to have specific responsibilities to manage uh, uh, the preparations for the coming uh, uh, conference. This is a, a, a long-term process. So success, I'm not really concerned of having a, a, a great success in this conference because I don't know what is success. The success should be having a, some sort of a clear vision for what to do in the coming two years and to put it on paper to agree up, uh, upon it. This is uh, 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 basically uh, the issue. Uh, one last uh, thing. I, I, I'm not sure uh, uh, what uh, Taria was talking about when it, she mentioned uh, uh, security, negative security assurances. Are you proposing that a group of uh, uh, countries in the region would uh, uh, adhere to a treaty, agree to a treaty, uh, uh, and then get security assurances from the nuclear weapon states and from Israel? Is that the idea? I don't think with the current culture in the region that is feasible, uh, I don't think there's enough trust in the world of the nuclear weapons states in providing these uh, 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 security assurances and uh, our experience with them in other zones was not very positive. And these are easy zones. These are uh, 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 not as problematic as the Middle East. So uh, I, I don't know how this could be achieved. It's, it, it's worth looking into, of course, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm, it's, it's unclear to me how can we bring countries in the region to have a treaty and then ask Israel for security assurances. Seems a little bit... Uh, 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 far-fetched for me. Oh yeah, I'll come straight back to you uh, now uh, to answer that. Well, uh, wait a minute. Am I still muted? No, 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 you, no you're, you're okay. 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 No, I, I think it's, it's the other way around. It's not a question of the countries uh, going to a treaty and then hoping that Israel would, would actually come with uh, unconditional legally based security assurances. It's the other way around. These security assurances which are legal and actually unconditional, have to be issued by Israel before anything else or by France. And, and so the question is how to guarantee, I mean, if there's not trust enough from the countries to Israel, then one has to discuss, maybe the US should be the backing up. And I know that we have this situation that, that uh, countries don't trust uh, security ass assurances and experience is, is actually very detrimental to, to nuclear disarmament and to the establishing the zones. So I, I think this has to change before any new uh, zones will be possible. Okay, thank you, Taya, for that clarification. Uh, I'll go to Hen next. Um, Hen, what's, what's your feeling about what uh, a success, however low or high, uh, would look like realistically next week? And who do you think needs to move first? I think I, I really like what uh, Wael said, which is it's a process and we are at the beginning of the process and we need to realize it. Like uh, putting too high bars out there will not help the process. We really need to understand that this is, as Wael said, uncharted territories, the, a territory that many countries in the region 
have never been before, didn't do not have the experience, the legal, the technical experience for. And this is a figuring out almost exercise. And it's good that it's happening. It's important that it's happening. And we we as the international community, as experts, should support it, should continue to inform it. And we and, and the conference as a process will uh, should have the uh, incentives to sort out more information and more technical capacity and help from us. Uh, I think anyone in the crowd and as a speaker will be very happy to inform the process and help. And as uh, uh, Tarek said, uh, there's so many, there's so much information out there, but diplomats are not technical people. They're not legal advisors, they're not the one that's going to negotiate the details. So once we start to be more serious about the details, they are abundant of information that uh, can be provided to the conference and the process. So I, I think let's make sure that we are understanding where the process is, what, what is the capabilities of the ones that are attending it, and what is the objective? The objective right now is to have a process. And by itself, uh, countries in the region see that as important. Thank you, Hen. Um, I'd like to pass on to Hossein next. Hossein. Yes, uh, I agree that this is a process, but the reality is that the process started uh, mid-1995. It is 20, 30 years, practically with zero achievement. I mean, practical achievement other than some statements, some resolutions, some nice uh, conferences. That's why I would suggest uh, uh, for the next conference, upcoming conference, if the outcome should be a plan of action with timetable. Because if we only uh, imagine uh, agreeing on a working group would be really a big achievement. I promise you the working group would continue for 10 years with zero achievement. Uh, the reasons I explained in my talks. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting to uh, our meeting today that Paul uh, and the others, uh, you can uh, collect every suggestion made by the panelists and the audience and the participants and uh, send it as a proposal suggestion uh, with the general idea of a plan of action with timetable. If we agree, I agree with Wild that a working group would be a good achievement, but we should mention that this working group needs to achieve three months, six months, nine months, one year, uh, to uh, what we expect. It should not be open-ended. Okay. Thank you. And uh, finally, Tariq, uh, before we go to the next round. Tariq. Mm -hmm. Yep. So in my uh, short uh, op-ed, I did mention that the working groups would have a technical mandate because these are at the three, uh, at least two of the three are technical organizations, the IAEA and the OPCW. Here in Vienna, many of the missions, of, including the, those of the states of the region, have technical people, people from their atomic energy uh, establishments, if they are a country that has them. So it is possible, at least in Vienna, to, to talk about some of the modalities of verification and, and safeguards and also peaceful uses. So the working group would not be open-ended. The working group would have... Uh, uh, some technical uh, mandates that are broken down in, into short, short pipes of work. Uh, one wouldn't expect these people to be working uh, full time. My suggestion is in, in Vienna to, to nominate the UAE to chair the group in Geneva, uh, Egypt, uh, in Iran, in, in the uh, Hague. Uh, uh, and um, uh, sorry. sorry. Sorry, it's uh, yeah, Khaled Aish. Can you yeah. mute him, Paul? I can't. Can Khaled Aish. So, um, the but there are practical outcomes. You know, um, first of all, I think this session should produce a short report that the president should present to the review conference in January as to what happened at this session. Uh, second, they should utilize this week to come up with a joint position of the states of the region, in this case, 
these are the NPT states of the region, as to what might be some elements or recommendations that could go into the final document of the NPT review conference. Hopefully we can have some. Instead of hashing it out there, this is a good opportunity where they are amongst themselves to come up with three or four action points, which can then be presented as a joint paper. Although at the moment, I know Egypt has a paper where they put up some draft elements uh, of a treaty there, but this conference needs to have a connection made to the NPT because for the 1995 review conference, the accountability factor is in the NPT. It's not in, it's not in the UN conference. This is a side element to contribute to the implementation of the 95 um, uh, a resolution. We should also be thinking about a troika. So the current chair is Kuwait. So probably the next two might be Lebanon or, or Libya, if, if they're willing. So instead of searching for a chair, we can, since we are going down in alphabetical order, we know what the next two countries would be for 22 and 23. And see, even if they don't nominate a person, they, they can still be involved in some sort of a troika for planning for the next year and, and the next year to have some sort of an action plan. And Paul, they could have stepping stones for Kazodin to be agreed, building blocks, stepping stones, and so on. Um, in Vienna, the, the mandate would be, you know, there, there are already people here from the states of the region working on peaceful uses and nuclear applications. So they are familiar with these techniques and technologies. They're also familiar with safeguards. So this is not asking them to do rocket science. Uh, they can work with the IAEA for legislative assistance. This is what I was doing for the Central Asian Zone when I was at the agency, helping them with the drafting of a treaty or considering of the elements and what might be the, the various uh, meanings or interpretations. The agency can provide this legislative assistance for free. It's part of their part of the service the agency provides to to, to member states. Uh, they're also they could also discuss elements of nuclear safety and security. Uh, there are three reactors churning out nuclear electricity in the region. Uh, the two of the states are not talking to each other that have operating power units. So there are elements on which uh, Iran and the Gulf states and others are willing to talk, provided somebody provides them a table to, to do so. So again, I think this conference would, could, be, could provide some beginnings for that. And, and finally, I'm happy to volunteer to work with the, the Vienna diplomats here to, to, to work in some sort of a informal working group or whatever to discuss potential elements of a treaty uh, that they can uh, discuss in the context of the IAEA's uh, June board meeting where the uh, Middle East report is presented and then at the general conference next year where again, the Middle East issue um, is, is, is discussed. And finally, uh, while we're suggesting the model of the CTBTO, I would suggest the model of the Treaty of Tlatelolco which had graded accession. So it said as countries join, they can exceed. So the treaty finally entered into force only two or three years ago when Cuba was the last country to ratify. For many years, it was Brazil that was holding up. So I think there are whatever 33 states in Latin America. It didn't enter into force for all 33 of them. It entered into force in steps as countries became ready to join and to ratify. So I think it could be the same uh, for the Middle East. And then one country probably would be the last one to join, but that's fine. It would still be in force for, for, for the remaining ones. Uh, we, in the Vienna context, one can also talk about some discussion uh, about cooperating with the CTBTO and building the remaining monitoring stations uh, in the region. Those that are built but are not operating, maybe they can connect them um, and also um, have some data sharing, which again is a right of CTBT states parties to get the data from the international monitoring system, which is useful for them for earthquakes. It's useful for them for monitoring the oceans. It's useful for them for monitoring the environment. So there are a lot of practical things that can be done, uh, which don't require much effort, which don't require much money. It, it, it's there for the taking. Thanks, Tariq. I uh, can always rely on you for a very long list of ideas, uh, many, most of which are absolutely spot on, uh, and the others um, are also good. Sharon, can I come to you next? Thanks. Uh, I'll start as METO, but I'll continue as the Israel disarmament movement, because I have to. Um, 
So, so as, as the Middle East Treaty Organization, of course, one of the things that we desire most is a successful conference. And I, I know that we don't know what a successful conference means in general, but I can tell you what we can fantasize about. What we are fantasizing about is the states in the room um, finding everything that they can agree on. Um, there, there are so many parts of any text that they should arrive to that they can agree the scope um, um, some of the some of the articles um, are are some 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 things that all states already know that they can agree on but one of the things that I think are more important than what article they can agree on is the dedication to work throughout the year and not just take uh, towards the conferences and another thing is that if we work together, civil society and diplomats, and the and the statement that came out from the last November conference was calling for uh, the collaboration of civil society. So we would really like it to be extended this invitation this year. And another benefit of it is not just the the, the ideas that flow from uh, from, from experts, but also that if it's a track one and a half meeting, track two. Attack two meetings, then there will be Israelis in the room. It might be more comprehensive. We might, and that, and, and that brings me to to my role as the Israeli disarmament movement. This will also help any campaign in Israel, because right now the November conference is not in the media in Israel. Iran is in the mid, in, is in the media in Israel, and when we discuss Iran in the Israeli media. It's with uh, zero knowledge. I mean, when you're talking about capacity building, we are a democracy that doesn't discuss these things. So nobody say, almost nobody say, uh, things that are very, very rational. For example, Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons because Iran didn't decide to build them. Once they decide to build them, it will be very hard to stop them from doing so. So how come our diplomacy is not going to that direction? The November conference is a great opportunity also for Israel. But only a campaign in Israel, of course, will solve it. And meanwhile, yeah, there's been work towards the zone since 95, but without the belief that it's possible, it can't work. Without goodwill, it can't work. And if the only um, agenda is Israel, it won't work. And I'm not saying it because I'm Israeli. I'm saying it as an Israeli disarmament movement. I would like to have a ground where Israel can join. I would like to have a treaty that Israel can join. And this is something that the states in the room can achieve without Israel. Actually, they'll achieve it easier when Israel is not in the room, if they'll remember that at the end of the day, they would like Israel to join. So the text will have to take into consideration um, also some of Israel's um, worries. I'll stop here, even though I, I do have a lot to say. And the last thing I'll say is that the double standard is is extremely annoying. The P5, the other nuclear armed states, NATO sharing, I mean, all of them needs to be solved. It's not just Israel and the Middle East, of course. And one of the things that the, the, the states in the room can do in their statement is to call for all other states to put a timeline, for example, the P5 at the NPT. But they can also ask the states at the NPT not to use the Middle East the way it was used in 2015. There is a process this process needs to be protected. This process um, needs a place to grow. So the states can either help by hosting roundtables, for example, or really hands off the Middle East. We have a process, let it, uh, let it have its course. Thank you very much. Sharon, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to Leila and then Mark, and then we're going to have to zip through uh, any final comments from the panelists. So Leila, can I come to you next? Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear. Hello. Okay. So, um, I the question I was going to ask is being answered by the couple of the two last speakers, but I would gladly uh, just uh, put it uh, in another way. As Mr. Wael was saying, that the Middle East weapon uh, uh, mass destruction free zone is a process, and it has. We have to, to start. I would want to ask him, will he, uh, 
is he recommending that we start with the Arab League, then Iran would follow, then uh, eventually we'd hope that Israel at the end will uh, agree to access to this treaty. And as Mr. Tarika said, that was what uh, uh, the Tatalimku uh, Treaty did. And this is how they come to realize the zone there in the Latin America. So is it ever possible? Can we imagine that the Arabs will agree to move forward first and take the first step to initiate the zone and to sign a treaty without Iran signing it and without Israel? And then even if we uh, as Arabs, the Arab League would initiate this process and agree to take the first step, what would be the guarantees that or the assurances that Iran would follow or that Israel eventually would follow? As we know that Israel would always uh, maintain its long corridor uh, the policy and that uh, the Arabs in the other ways sees it as only procrastination tactics and they don't really trust the Israelis. So will anybody take the first step? I'm not an expert in politics, so I'm asking this pro for the diplomats to answer me. Then I would wa also want to know if the lately... Um, those uh, Abraham Accords, would, would those Accords give any hope that the process would go any further this time? Thank you. Leila, thank you very much. Um, and uh, for the final question or statement, Mark, before we go to the panelists. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, excellent discussion. And uh, just, uh, just a couple of remarks. The um, following what actually uh, Sharon said, uh, of course, we talked about a lot about the diplomatic process, you know, and, and in a couple of years, actually, we'll celebrate 50 years of the first proposal of a zone. So it's, it's been a long process. And um, as Mr. Musavian said, not very conclusive, not very successful. So it's, of course, it's, it's good. It's important to continue to to including, as, as uh, Tarek proposed, to have focus on, on technical issues, verification. Uh, it's always good to, to, to interact and to, to address all these uh, uh, questions. But uh, as, as Sharon explained, you know, the, the big elephant uh, uh, in the room is, is Israel. And we know that, uh, you know, uh, irrespective of the process, uh, uh, and I would say even as a reaction to the process, because it, Israel doesn't like to be uh, singled out or cornered or named and shamed. Uh, and um, uh, uh, there were very few, few exceptions in the, when Israel accepted this, this, you know, security dialogue, very, very deep and, and, and but of, of course it had to be con confidential. So my question is, wouldn't it be better, or in parallel, could we perhaps facilitate the diplomatic process if there was serious dialogue uh, within Israel, with Israel, uh, at, the, at various levels of government, and including the security establishment? I don't know if you noticed recently the, the former chief of Mossad, uh, uh, you know, admitted that it was a mistake uh, to be critical of the JCPOA and. Um, and of course, he criticized Trump for uh, its withdrawal. So this shows that you know there are, you can you have nuances uh, within the, the the system. And of course, as as Sharon said, of course, civil society has a major role to play in um, campaigns. But there are um, I was just recalled uh, by Leila. There are new countries now with uh, diplomatic relations with Israel. Of course. Egypt and uh, Jordan had for a long time, but now these uh, new countries that normalize relations with Israel could also raise these issues, you know, uh, apart from any um, uh, political or diplomatic pressure, just to uh, perhaps try and influence Israel's threat perception, which will be, uh, of course, a, a determining factor of its decision about nuclear weapons. Mark, thank you very much for, for that fi those final comments. Um, I, I'll 
go to the panel just to let people know i uh, we will finish 10 minutes late which gives panelists two minutes each so please be uh, as brief as you can uh, so that people's days are uh, sticking to plan um hussein I'll, I'll come to you first Paul, I have nothing to add other than what I suggested for a plan of action and to collect all the suggestions from this meeting and send it official for those responsible for the upcoming conference. Okay, thank you, Hussein. Um, while can I come to you next? And, and particularly, I think the question from Leila is relevant around trust and uh, choreography. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, that's a very pertinent question from uh, uh, Ms. Layla Hanawi, and uh, it, the, the answer to me at least is obvious. Uh, without, as was described by Mark, the elephant in the room, there can be no zone. Uh, it doesn't make sense to have an Arab zone and then try to get Iran and then Israel into it. If you have the zone, they will never get into it. I have to remind you of uh, uh, that the history of the zone and the history of non-proliferation in the region regarding the Middle East zone has been marred with broken promises over the years. That's why there is no trust. This is why I'm proposing to get around this issue of having Israel first in by do, uh, uh, elaborating the, the, the treaty itself and then adopt the formula of the CTBT, which is to start work, to even have an organization without having it uh, uh, into force, the treaty into force, until certain parties get into the treaty uh, itself, uh, then it can be enforced. But we should not postpone the cooperation on uh, say, uh, 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 peaceful uses of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 nuclear energy or verification uh, techniques uh, and, uh, 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 and things like that in the region until Israel comes in. But the treaty cannot be enforced without Israel, Iran, and the major Arab states like Egypt, like Iraq, like Saudi Arabia, these, these uh, countries. Without them, there cannot be a zone. And there is no such thing as an Arab zone. This is why we were very much opposed to the idea that was in the Gulf at one point, which is to have a Gulf uh, 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 free zone, uh, because it divides the region into groups, uh, those who have and those who do not have, and things like that. It's a very confusing uh, formula. But there are ways, innovative ways, to try to move forward. Uh, and go around the political uh, uh, minds uh, that are, uh, are, are, have been always there. Thank you, Wael. Um, May I say one thing? Oh, yes, uh, go, yes go ahead. On, on the plan of action uh, uh, that uh, uh, Hossein proposed, of course, I, we have been thinking about that uh, also. And I think it's a very good idea. Unfortunately, the conference next week cannot come up with a plan of action. Uh, they haven't worked on it. They haven't thought about it. They haven't discussed it. So maybe they can take a decision to work intercessionally on a plan of, of, of action for three years, for instance, or something like uh, along, along these lines. It's a good idea, but it's a bit late in the minds of, of, of in, uh, people who are conducting the, the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Wael. Um, I'll go to Taya next. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, uh, the main injustice of, of the situation is that the nuclear weapon states can maintain their nuclear weapons either as P5 or as Israel, and, and they don't even have to guarantee for those that have abstained that they will not be attacked by nuclear weapons. I think this is uh, really a nuclear order which is out of any phase today. I, I agree that the situation is polarized and that there cannot be an Arab nuclear uh, free zone. But on the other hand, if, if you accept it as a stepwise procedure, procedure, I think the 
security guarantees, legally More. based and unconditional, would be necessary. And I agree, plan of action would be fine. It could expose some More. Of the And also, I think the Treaty of Tablelko that was supposed by, suggested by Tarek, is a good example. But Cuba joined almost 40 years after the treaty was established. Is it possible to think that it will take 40 years for the last country in the region to join? No. So time is of essence here. Thank you. Thank you, Taya. I'd like to go to Tariq next uh, before finishing with Han. Tariq. Yep, so I better understood uh, why now when he gave his uh, model of the CTBTO, so I fully support it. And so we already have the MITO, and I think maybe we can bequest it to, to the states. Uh, but, you know, a, a nuclear weapon-free area already exists in the Middle East, except for Israel. Iran and all the other Arab states are in the NPT. Some of them are in Palindaba. They all have IAEA verification. Uh, so what they are basically lacking is, is what Weil said. So at least on, on the nuclear side, they could set up uh, some sort of an informal entity or an organization to start with. And then they can build it up and bring in the parts of uh, BW, CW, and delivery systems as, as things move. Because at least they have a basis to start with uh, here in Vienna. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. And we began with you, Han, and we finished with you. And so you've got Thank two you. or three minutes. Uh, more than enough. Thank you. To solve all the problem of the zone. Um, <laughs> so with regard to the issue enter of, uh, entering into force, and obviously it's going to be a, a, a huge issue. And I think it's important for regional states or participating states to start thinking about the different models. The, the issue here is really um, how to bring Israel in and will it become before, during or after. And and you heard in between the different panelists, different opinion. And I think the question really is related to regional state will be, um, will they want to wait until Israel is joining or as well said on the other end, uh, there is no point for a zone without Israel joining. So I think there is a lot of uh, to think about it and, and to make sure that there is um, some a long debate about it because there are many options and there are ways to address it as well. Uh, with regard to the issue of um, trust and uh, regional development right now, I think what we see right now in many ways is actually really positive developments that we really need to capture and build upon. Um, I, I would say in some ways the uh, U.S. attempt to withdraw from the region created a situation where regional states are trying to uh, take security on their own end, and it's creates two, I would say, trends that happening in parallel. One is uh, reconciliation or trying at least to reconcile to reconcile and to negotiate in peaceful ways. So you see the Saudi-Iranian negotiations, uh, we see the Qatari recon reconciliation, etc., and, and the Abraham Accords. On the other end, because of the U.S. withdrawal, there will be attempt, and we see it on the conventional side, for, for armament which could spill over to also other weapon of mass destruction. And those two trends can happen at the same time and live together. So the question is how we capitalize on the positive aspects and prevent the negative ones. And that's an excellent question to finish on and an open question to everybody who's interested in this area. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. Sorry, we ran over my fault entirely, um, but uh, uh, we will be sending out the, um, the recording to everybody who, who uh, registered, so you should be getting that in the next couple of days. Uh, do encourage others to, uh, to listen or, or to um, view if you can. Uh, so with that, I think we'll finish.